Because I gotta tell you, I'm not a morning person. Sunday morning can hurt tough sometimes. <laughs> I think sometimes when we come in here for practice, I, I can come in wearing sunglasses. <laughs> what happened to you? It's morning. And it doesn't help that God paired me with someone who loves the mornings. Oh, that's here to <laughs> You people say to me, you know what I'm talking about. We're right. They're wrong. <laughs> anyway, I'm thankful to be here. I love nothing more than to talk about God and Jesus. Uh, I, so much so that I think sometimes the young people shy away from talking about that because I will talk their ears off if they ask me a question. I'll be like, all right, pull up a chair. Let's go. Let's talk about God. And so I'm thankful to be here and uh, talking about Jesus and talking about this world and I'm thankful to God and all of the things that he has done for us. And, and I am just so happy and, and pleased with what the Lord has done so far. And I'm excited with what he's doing yeah. now. Yeah. And I, I just declare victory for what he's going to do in the future, right? Yeah. So uh, well, let's get into his word here today in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 5. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Crystal, would you say a prayer for us, please? Father God, we just um, we, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we have, God, to be in your word, to hear your truth. And um, Lord, as, as we came here today, God, we, we come from different places and different needs, but God, you know all of them, and the wonderful thing is that you can be every one of them. So Father, we just trust you today as we bring this, God, brings your word to us, Lord. Help us to soak it in, God, and to apply it to our lives, Lord, and just to look to you more and more, God, the yes, truth that you are, the power that you have, God. Um, and we, we give our lives to you, Father. We ask you to speak to us today, Father. Amen. 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 When I read that passage of scripture about uh, James saying, Consider it pure joy whenever you find trials of many kinds. I know you're probably thinking of that person that I think of when I read that. What a nut job. Consider it joy. I liked uh, Zach Greinke used to be a pitcher for the Kansas City Royals. And uh, one interview, I remember the uh, uh, TV news journalist was asking him if he liked facing some of the better uh, batters because he wanted the challenge. And he said, no, I want to face the terrible ones because that's easier. It's <laughs> easier. And that speaks to us right there, right? Yes, no, because it's easier. And, and so, yeah, I think nut job when I consider it pure joy when you're going through trials. What? Are you happy? And I tell you what, there's one thing I don't see when you look on Facebook is a whole lot of joy. I think it's just common. And when everybody brings up 2020, we've got to do it by complaining. It's a bad thing. And I don't see a whole lot of joy on Facebook, which is why I don't go there much anymore. Come on. <laughs> But before we get started, I want to kind of share a little story that I heard. And I'm going to try to stay here, CJ. Last time I talked, I was kind of like all the way over here and all the way over here. So the folks who watch this at home, they're like, I don't know where you went, but he's here somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, there was a story I heard about a woman who loved her pet snake. And it was one of these, I don't know, I'm going to probably say the wrong species, but it was one of those 25 foot long anacondas, or I mean, it was just one of those beastly kind of snakes, and she adored it. She took care of this snake. She fed this snake. And, and, and one of the other things she did that I think was really weird, I'm not no judging here, I'm not judging, but she liked to sleep with the snake. So all right, so you guys are judging back there too, so I'm not the only one. All right, I'm not doing, when I read that, I was like, <laughs> But she, she got a lot of comfort from this because what happened was that she would sleep in her bed in kind of the fetal position and this big long snake 
wrapped himself around her, and I don't know, made her feel comfortable, made her feel safe, it kept her warm. I don't know. I don't know what she was going for, but it seems really weird to me, but she slept with this snake continuously. This was a normal routine for her. And then one day out of nowhere, the snake stopped eating. One week went by, no eating. Two weeks go by, no eating. She began to get concerned for her pet snake. And so she went to a veterinarian to talk about this and find out what it was that could be wrong with the snake. And the veterinarian told her, you better get rid of that snake because it's preparing itself to eat you. Oh God, help us. Help us to not have pet snakes in our lives, right? Help us to not have pet snakes in our lives. A couple weeks ago when I got to speak, I threw a little bit of history out at you. I'm going to do a little bit more of that today. I just, I kind of, in my nature, as like a CSI, I like to take things apart and figure out, you know, what happened over here. Don't ask me to put it back together, but I do like to take it apart. When we were putting those basketball goals together, opening it up, just putting it together, oh no, I need Rob, and I'm going to ask several other guys, Brother Rick and, and Rick, and I'm going to ask these guys to come help me put them together. But I can take it apart. <laughs> But I was doing some research about our young adults today, and I'm not talking about our young adults back here, so I'm not attacking our group here, but young adults as a whole in the Church of America. Okay? And it was Barna Group who were paid to do a study because they have found that near 70% of our young adults today are leaving the church. That number shocked me. So, I mean, I know a bunch of them leave, but 70%. 70%. After high school, they leave, they go to college, and they just don't go to, to, to church. And most of the time when you ask them at first, all of the reasons are kind of like, well, you know, I went off to college and didn't really find your home church or whatever, and that was kind of the, the reasons they were getting at first. And I'm sorry, this thing I'm going to be dealing with it all the time. But as they kept digging, as they kept asking, they kept, you know, peppering them with one question after another, one question after another, and they started to get back down to the base of, of some of their reasonings. And listen to them, 30% admitted that they felt the church was too exclusive and were afraid of the beliefs of other faiths. So they left. 31% said church was boring. 25% said the church demonizes everything outside of the church. They demonize it. 22% said the church is too concerned that movies, music, and video games are harmful. 30% said that they were forced to choose between my faith and my friends. 66% said they left for intellectual reasons. And 20% said, God seemed missing from my experience at church. And it kind of struck me when I look at some of the reasons that these, these young adults gave the Barna Research Group as to why they were leaving. And it's something that I've noticed throughout the history of youth ministry, that going all the way back to the 30s, and I saw many of the lessons plans in this book, Juvenilization of American Christianity, talk about what was that most of the youth ministers at the time were targeting from the 30s to the 40s to the 50s to the 60s to the 70s and so on. And there was one common theme, what they always focused on with young people. What we, what I focused on with our young people in the church. And it's always lessons about behavior. Do this. Don't do that. It's called, I mean, all the way back in the 30s, they've been wanting to talk about sex. And they want to talk about what can they get away with. They want to talk about alcohol. They want to talk about drugs. They want to talk about all of this stuff. It's about behaviors. Do this. Don't do that. Hang out with those friends. Don't hang out with those friends. Watch out for these video games. Watch out for these movies. It's the same. It has never changed. And it kind of struck me a little bit when I read some of these passages of scriptures in Mark chapter 3. 13 through 14, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. 
And they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. And in Revelation 3 and 20, and let's be honest, we could be here all day with verses like this, right? So I picked two of them. <laughs> Revelation 3 and 20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus constantly talked about the relationship aspect. Be with me. Spend time with me. Talk to me. And I think the church or youth ministry as a whole, we made a mistake. We made a mistake when we were talking about watch out for these movies, watch out for this. We, 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 here's why we made that mistake because we were listening to Jesus when he said, uh, I got it over here. Don't, don't worry about bringing it up. By the way, I've done this like three different times, and every time it's come out different. So this is like the box of chocolate sermon, <laughs> and you never know what you're going to get. When Jesus said, do not love the world or anything in the world, if anyone loves the world, love the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so this is what we were trying to warn our kids, and we made a mistake of assuming that since they were churchgoers, they were Christ followers. Right. 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 So you can see it in the, some of the reasons why this, some of these people left the church. They demonize everything outside of the church. Well, why do we do that? Why do we warn them about not chasing after the things of this world? It's because of their relationship with Christ. It's because of their relationship with Christ. And we didn't spend a whole lot of time with our lessons about that. Because most of the times the young people just want to come in and find out what can they get away with. That's kind of normal with kids, right? <laughs> Me too. Me too. I think often Crystal says, if you just tell, if I tell you not to do something, then you're going to want to do it. Yes. That sums me up right there. <laughs> but you can see it in their answers. I was forced to choose between my faith and my friends. They, there was no room in there for a relationship with Jesus. Because if they had a relationship with Jesus, they would understand the lessons. They would understand not lessons, but warnings. Warnings. Today, the average young person spends maybe two hours a week in church. Two hours a week in church. And some of them are missing that because of school functions, sports, bands, what have you. And adults, let's be honest, we use work as an excuse, we use family time as an excuse, and hey, I want some downtime because i got to rest to get ready to go back to work tomorrow, right? Oh, we use all kinds of reasons not to spend time with Jesus. Not to spend time in his word. Not to spend time in prayer. All kinds of reasons and excuses. And, and all of those things aren't really bad by themselves. But if they're taking us away from our pursuit with God, then they may as well be the snake that we love and is eating us alive. So what is it we're fighting in front of us? What is our battle? What is the battle in front of us? 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. David and Goliath. Most everybody knows this passage. This is a, this is a favorite of children's church workers. I think you'd like it too. You'd like it too. Starting with verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine armies to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. So we've seen this in our minds when we read this passage of Scripture a lot. I don't know about you, but the theater of the mind is often better than what they produce in Hollywood, right? And so here in my mind, I can picture this nine-foot-tall specimen. And it was no string bean guy either, right? This was a big dude. Let's give him his credit. 
And so everybody's afraid, right? Because they can see what's in front of them. They're dealing with the physical stuff. They're dealing with the now. And every single person there saw the now. Big, bad guy. And we don't have anybody that big, so we're going to cower over here. So the Israelite warriors saw the big, bad guy. Saul saw the big, bad guy. The Philistines saw the big, bad guy. Goliath knew he was a big, bad guy. And then there's one person who's a teenager. There's been some guesses as to his age. Some say he was in his mid to upper 20s, but if he was that old, he would have been in the army, right? So he had to be young enough to not be in the army. So he's a teenager. Some people just settle on the fact that he was 17 or 18 years old. A teenager. And he comes on the scene. And he sees the battle for what it is. It's not the physical war that they're fighting in front of them. But the battle was spiritual. How do I know David knew that? Well, first he said, this day the Lord will deliver you into our hands. And he's not going to do it with a sword. The Lord, Almighty God of the armies of Israel. And he wasn't talking about those dudes over there shaking in fear. All those gathered, you will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saved. The battle is spiritual. Crystal and I went to go uh, to this guy who's been holding revivals throughout all these these towns, you know, um, in, in California, they had this massive baptismal service, and people went in the ocean to get baptized by this guy, and he's slowly marching his way to Washington, D.C. Next Sunday, that's where he's going to go. But Crystal and I had this discussion, we, you know, there was a little bit, I hope that there isn't going to be a whole lot of people protesting there, we know the climate of today, and so we were kind of worried about What's going to happen if somebody tries to confront us or whatever? We have to, we need to remind ourselves that I'm not fighting that person holding that sign. And that person holding that sign doesn't hate me. It's all spiritual. There's a spirit behind them holding that sign, rebelling against God. They don't like what God says. And there's a spirit behind that. And my battle is not with that person, but the spirit in, involved in, in, in their actions. It's a spiritual battle. And therefore, our, our tactic should be more of a spiritual tactic than a physical one. Now me, my first inclination is, all right, let's go. That's me, and I think the Lord, many times when I'm in that situation, he takes over. Right? He takes, because I turn from this to, oh, oh Lord God. Pastor's going to talk a little bit about this next week, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the glories, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what I just said to you didn't just come from me, it came from God. It's a spiritual battle that we have. That's what we need to start looking at, this, this war in front of us. And this country is torn apart, not just in two places. Right? Thousands of places. Thousands of places. And it's being torn apart to the very foundation. And it's not a physical war. It's a spiritual one. And it's not one that's going to be won by bullets or swords. God said, or David said, God's going to win this and he's not going to do it with a sword. God's going to win this and he's not going to do it with bullets. AK 47s, whatever it is we can stock up for ourselves. But I had to ask a question. I needed to take this apart because I had to find out what it was that made a 17-year-old boy understand really what was going on when all of the men in there had no clue. What was going on? And there's a little, little bit of a clue here when Saul's like, you can't do this, David. You can't do this. And his response, 
in chapter 17, verse 34 through 36. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When the lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. David had an experience with God, not just a experience. He had numerous experience with God. And we find out when David was, was out there in the field, he spent many time pursuing God, seeking God. Reaching out to God, crying out to God. It was David who said, as the deer pants for the water, my soul pants for you. And so David spent many time with God. A lot of time. A lot of time. As he spent his time out there pursuing God, God sent him some trials. I know David was... Uh, kind of a stud as far as warriors go, but I don't think he, he, he was hoping that a bear or a lion would come up upon him. I don't remember reading a prayer where David asked God, please send a lion my way. <laughs> but it happened. And God was with David. And he rose up. And he grabbed the lion by his hair. And he killed the lion. And David had these experiences with God. And it prepared him for that showdown with Goliath. Goliath didn't know it, but he had no chance. But because David spent time with God, he was prepared. He was ready. He didn't shrink from the challenge before him. He saw the sword. He saw the spear. He saw the shield. He saw all the armies. All he needed was a stone. Because he had spent time with God. Spent time with God. Now, last weekend I got to go talk to a bunch of young people. and So I, I tried to pretend like if we were going to go back in time. And if there was one thing I could go tell my younger self. And then I had to go back. One thing that I would tell myself. What would it be? And you sit there and you think about it. And you know I Oftentimes I joke that I would go back and tell myself that in 1985 the Kansas City Royals would win the World Series. Go bet some money. Yeah. But we don't gamble, so. So I was thinking to myself, well, what could be more important than money? Because there's only one thing I could tell my younger self. What would it be? What would it be? And it was right here in Samuel 17, 34 through 36, when I read that David had spent so much time with God, that God had prepared him to receive what he was going to go through into the future, that I realized that what I need to tell my younger self is to just pursue God with all you have until you have no more breath in you. Just seek God with all that you've got. He will get you. He will take you where you want to go. He will complete the perfect work he started in you. Just keep seeking him. Keep seeking him. Read his word. Spend time in prayer. Worship him. Keep seeking him. That would be the one thing I would tell my younger self. And it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that that uh, everything is going to go your way. Sometimes it feels like God's answering every single one of your prayers, and sometimes it feels like God's not even listening to you. Just keep seeking Him. Just keep seeking Him. Because God has a plan. I don't have these verses for you, CJ, so don't look for them. It was... It was it was uh, God who said, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. It was Jesus who said in John 16, 33, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And yes, we are having trouble this year. But where some people see heartache and trials and, and troubles, we as the church should see opportunities. It's about relationships. 
It's about how much time are we going to spend in some area or another. And what I would tell my younger self, that the world and, and its desires will pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Pursue God with everything that you have. Because the battle in front of you isn't physical, it's spiritual. It's spiritual. And we're not going to win it with bullets. We're not going to win it with weapons. We're not going to win it with fists. We're going to overcome that on our knees. Praying. Seeking God with all that we have. Um, I don't know if there's going to be any music or something like that. We'll get prepared to come to the altar. We'll spend some time because here's where our battle begins. You know, Sometimes we have this attitude, and, and I'm more guilty of this than anybody, so if I'm saying this to anybody, I'm really saying this to me. And someday I'll get, I'll get to that. Someday, right now I'm kind of busy, someday I'll get to that, I'll get to, to the point where I can seek God more and more, but today is someday. And so I want to see, I want to try to teach our young people who are here today that the battle is the Lord's. And he's not going to win it with the sword or spear. And so we need to fight this spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. Yes. Next week, the pastor's going to talk about spiritual weapons. But today, I want to, to just have us begin seeking God on our knees with our hearts and with our minds. And it's okay to tell God, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know what to ask for, God. But I know this, the battle is yours. And so all the fear, all of the anxiety, all of the stress of not knowing what or how or when or whatever, I'm just going to give that to you. Right. I'm just going to give that to you. And I'm going to begin fighting this spiritual battle today on my knee, on my knee, seeking you with all of my heart. And the person who does that, the person who continuously seeks God with all of their heart, ends up becoming this person in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 5. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. When you spend time with God continuously, you will see tough times as opportunities, not bad things. It's an opportunity because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to you. I could have spent some time, I got a whole bunch of stats here of, of, of non churchgoers and churchgoers of how much time they spend in God's word and how much time they spend in worship and how much time they spend in prayer. And, and you know what? It would, it would have been a lot of time. I'll tell you, the, the, the numbers aren't really that much different. And so you need to take a personal inventory of yourself. How much time do I spend with God? Do I, do I look at studying His Word as more of a job, as more of a labor, labor or as more of a, all right, I get to know more about my relationship that I have with my God, with my Savior? Let's ask God to help us with that. I, I, rec I identify with an individual that told Jesus, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Right? Does it have to look perfect? And sometimes it's ugly. Let's seek God with all of our heart because the battle in front of you, 2020, political, all the stuff that's going on, the, the, the riots, the protests, all this is a spiritual battle before you. And we need to start fighting this spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. And let's seek God with all of our heart. Let's, let's go pray right now. Hello, I'm Pastor John with Prairie Center Church of God of Prophecy. I pray that this message will instruct your mind and inflame your heart and influence your will along with us to love God, care for one another, and serve the world in Jesus' name. Thank you.